order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses at any time. We welcome everyone here today to a hearing on the now five-year tendered Music Modernization Act. We are joined by several of our colleagues today uh, who could not sit on the dais but may be joining us, and without objection, they will be allowed to sit and participate as time permits. I will now recognize myself for a short opening statement. Today we are taking a look at the MMA, the Music Modernization Act, as it approaches its fifth year anniversary. Just five short years ago, the still, still active, still performing, still entertaining Sam Moore and Mike Love of the Beach Boys stood at a signing ceremony and enjoyed the fact that their music, 50 years after a reform that covered everyone post-72, would now cover them. That portion of the act is settled law, and today we will likely not speak much about it. But much of the other reform in music modernization involved trying to get stakeholders who had agreed to enhance, modernize, and more quickly solve the critical problems of licensing musical works. Today we will explore what has worked and what has not. Music is important to America for many reasons, including it is in fact a multi-billion dollar business that employs millions of America. People around the world have been inspired by our music, have learned the English language as a result of our music, and we have enjoyed music from around the world and for decades have rewarded artists enough that some of them are not washing dishes. Recording artists, musicians, sound engineers, producers, and other professionals have in fact entertained the billions of people around the world since time immemorial. Five years ago, we knew that navigating the complex music licensing ecosystem was too difficult for many of the creators to do on their own and certainly impossible for the songwriters to do without congressional action. Too many, too many creators were unable to collect the royalties they deserved because of legal and logistical obstacles. And the digital music revolution was proving to be too much for our outdated copy laws to handle. So both parties came together to pass the MMA. And I want to thank my fellow members of the House and the Senate, many of whom are here today for the work they did. But I also want to thank and reward the stakeholders, some of whom did so without direct financial benefit, but in fact knowing that their industry could only thrive if they could improve that. Stakeholders came from all parts of it to help make a decision that was a compromise and in fact an experiment into whether or not we could make the system work efficiently enough to reward the creators. We're here today to listen to some of those creators and other key, st key stakeholders about whether the system we set up is working properly and what more needs to be done. We are here in Music City, home of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, to see if the MLC is solving the problems it was intended to solve. We are also here to further the work of this committee and especially the, the needs of the creators. Our Constitution makes it clear that the rights that we statutorily give out come from the benefit we receive. The fact is, inventions, works of art, creative music, and in, of course, uh, uh, our library of knowledge come from the copyrights and patents that this, this committee has for decades caused to be available. But if it's to succeed, we can't just grant a right. We have to, in fact, make sure that right is rewarded in a predictable way that allows for two business plans, the business plan of those who take the license and the business plan who those, of those who create the music we'll be talking about today. And with that, I yield to the gentleman from Georgia for his opening statement. I thank the gentleman from California for having this hearing and for uh, bringing the Judiciary Committee, the 
Subcommittee on Courts Intellectual Property and the Internet to Nashville, Tennessee, the heart of the music industry. The panel before us today is comprised of individuals from many sectors crucial to the creation and dissemination of musical works. I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say about the state of the music economy five years after the passage of the Music Modernization Act. Music can be both an expression of culture shared across every member of a community and a deeply personal experience unique to the listener. It can come from both symphonies in marble concert halls and lone performers on city streets. And it can both lull us to sleep and inspire us to action. Music can be many things to many people and this centrality to the human experience makes it even more important that the music industry is and remains healthy for every link in the production chain. Many music creators call my district home. Atlanta, Georgia is the capital of hip hop and R&B with a vibrant network of creators, writers, music labels, recording studios, and music venues. But that is just the beginning. Creators in Georgia are making music in everything from rap to bluegrass to gospel to classical music. Georgia Tech found that in 2016, the music industry in Georgia generated $3.5 billion and employed over 16,000 people. Today, Georgia's music industry supports an estimated 45,000 jobs with over 13,000 royalty recipients and over 91,000 songwriters. Five years ago, I joined ranking member Nadler and Tramon Issa as an original co-sponsor on the Music Modernization Act, which passed the House unanimously in 2018. The MMA replaced an antiquated, inefficient licensing system that was not able to respond to advancements in technology where creators were not fairly compensated for their works and publishers, labels, and streamers were constrained by unclear licensing guidelines. By creating the Mechanical Licensing Collective, or MLC, Congress sought to make it easier for digital services to obtain licenses and creators to co collect royalties by creating a blanket license and coordinating royalty payments when a song is streamed online. The MMA would not have been successful if the entire music industry had not united in agreement that something needed to be done. But that doesn't mean we believe the solution to be perfect. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about how the MLC is working and what improvements they believe might be necessary. In addition to creating the MLC, the Music Modernization Act also sought to pay artists fairly for their work by expanding the circumstances in which copyright royalty judges apply a willing buyer, willing seller rate setting standard and extending federal copyright protections to works created before 1972. Creators should be able to make a living, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about their experiences under the new standards. The MMA would not have been possible without the participation of nearly every sector of the music business, and it is a success story that is instructive for how industries can adapt to changes in technology that completely revolutionize their medium. We cannot and should not want to stop innovation. So the question before us is how Congress can work together with industries to protect intellectual property rights even as technologies advance. Finally, for the music industry, the challenges of the modern era are not limited to technological innovation. When COVID-19 made it unsafe to gather in large groups, many members of my community who were dependent on live music performances were left with no way to feed their families. In the spring of 2020, I fought for the inclusion of pandemic unemployment assistance to help freelancers, 
gig workers and others not traditionally covered by unemployment insurance gain access to those benefits. And later that year, I co-sponsored a bill to save our stages, uh, which was incorporated into a COVID-19 relief package and made $15 billion in grants available to live venues struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic. I'm looking forward to hearing from the creators on this panel as to how the pandemic affected their business and what Congress can do going forward to keep their part of the industry going strong. Thank you again to all of the witnesses for being here today, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, for, uh, for hosting and uh, calling this field hearing. I, I always tell people being a member of the House of Representatives sometimes is tedious and a little overwhelming because of the scope of issues. But every once in a while, you get to do something really cool. And, and that's what this is here today. So uh, thanks to uh, Belmont University as well for, for hosting us. And I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and for bringing this subcommittee to Nashville, one of the great music cities of the world. Music nourishes the soul. It expresses powerful ideas and emotions, and it connects us across cultures. It is also an important driver of economic activity. According to one estimate, the music industry contributes $170 billion a year to the American economy, and it supports, directly or indirectly, 2.7 million jobs. It is clear that artists, consumers, and businesses all depend on a healthy music industry to thrive. And that's why I was proud to join with my colleagues five years ago to sponsor and pass the Landmark Music Modernization Act. Prior to the MMA, the copyright laws governing music licensing had not been meaningfully updated in decades, with laws that, in some cases, were written when piano rolls were the dominant form of music. And that certainly did not contemplate the rise of digital streaming services. While music licensing remains a complex web of rights and responsibilities administered and enforced by a variety of different entities under a variety of different rules, the MMA helped address some of the most glaring inequities and inefficiencies in the music marketplace. I'm pleased that we have the opportunity today to examine how the law is operating five years later. The MMA contained three main sections, each aimed at a different segment of the music industry. The first part, the Musical Works Modernization Act, addressed concerns expressed by songwriters, music publishers, and digital streaming platforms related to the efficiency and fairness of the mechanical license for the reproduction and distribution of musical works. This measure created a blanket licensing system through the Mechanical Licensing Collective, based here in Nashville, to coordinate payment for these rights when a song is streamed online. This not only helped ensure that proper payment is made to songwriters and publishers, but it also helped provide certainty to digital platforms that they would not face liability for failing to acquire all the necessary licenses so long as they pay into the collective and follow its rules. I'm interested to hear from our stakeholders here today whether the MLC is operating as intended and whether any improvements are needed. The law also changed the standard for calculating royalty rates for songwriters by eliminating barriers that kept rates artificially low and made it difficult for songwriters to earn a living. I hope to learn more from our distinguished songwriters here today about the impact of this change. The second part of the MMA addressed an enduring inequity on the sound recording side. The Classics Act, a bill that I originally introduced with Chairman Issa, resolved the longstanding dispute over payment for, to artists for works recorded before 1972. In many cases, these legacy artists were collecting no royalties at all when their works were played on streaming platforms, a fundamental unfairness. The Classics Act addressed this problem by bringing these pre-72 works, which had been protected previously only by state laws, within the federal copyright system. I hope that we will learn today whether this provision has benefited these legacy artists as we had hoped. Finally, the MMA contained a provision to help ensure that music producers and engineers receive in an efficient manner the royalties that they are owed for their important contributions to the creation of music. Each of these provisions was the product of debate and compromise by the many stakeholders involved, forged over the course of many years of tireless work. 
Although we are here today observing the passage of the MMA nearly five years ago, it was another moment 10 years ago that is also worth recognizing. That is when former Chairman Bob Goodlatte first, first launched the committee's comprehensive copyright review. Over the course of five years, we held numerous hearings, roundtables, and listening sessions, and heard from dozens of stakeholders. It was this exhaustive bipartisan process that helped foster an environment in which the music industry could reach consensus on many important issues. Only then was critical legislation like the MMA possible. I hope that this hearing will serve as a reminder that meaningful change is possible when we all work together. One area in which I hope that agreement is possible is ensuring fair compensation for artists when their work is played on terrestrial radio. I consider this to be unfinished business, and I look forward to continuing to work with Chairman Issa on this issue, but that is a matter for another day. We have much to be proud of in passing the MMA, but no legislation is perfect, and I appreciate the opportunity to hear from our distinguished witnesses today on whether any refinements are needed. I thank the Chairman for, con for convening this important discussion. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman who now goes to the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing the subcommittee to Music City. It's great to be here, and it's great to be with my colleagues. Thank the witnesses for appearing. Look forward to their testimony and to a great discussion about uh, the MMA five years later. Uh, I came into Congress five years ago, so I've watched with interest how the MMA has uh, been implemented, how the MLC has uh, been developed and, and uh, unfolded as well. Uh, there are many challenges that remain. I look forward to discussing those today, but it's, uh, these are challenges that we can meet as we, as Chairman Nadler said, former Chairman Nadler said, that if we work together. You know, bipartisanship exists on this subcommittee. Uh, it is one of the few areas, we are an oasis, if you will, of bipartisanship in a sea of partisan rancor. And uh, so uh, I'm glad to be here with all of my colleagues and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We now introduce our distinguished panel of witnesses. Mr. Chris Arend is the Chief Executive Officer of Mechanical Licensing Collective. The MLC is a nonprofit organization designated to to, by the Copyright Office pursuant to the Music Modernization Act to administer blanket mechanical licenses for copyrighted musical works and collect, the, 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 collect and distribute the royalties. Prior to joining the MLC, uh, he worked for 20 years in the music industries and is a former Warner Music Group uh, uh, and Sony M BMG Music Entertainment alum. Mr. David Porter is an award-winning songwriter, producer, and singer. He was introduced into the Songwriting Hall of Fame in 2005, and Rolling Stone magazine named him one of the 100 greatest songwriters of all time, an award that is still elusive to me. <laughs> Mr. Porter uh, has written more and co-written more hits including Soul Man by Sam and Dave, a favorite of mine. And he continues to write, produce, and perform music for over 60 years, with his credits spanning music from Aretha Franklin to uh, today the most modern and current uh, stars. Mr. Porter is also the founder of a consortium known as MMT, a nonprofit organization designated to fostering music industry in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, another hometown of another well-known artist. Mr. Daniel Tassian is a, has been a songwriter, producer, and musician for nearly three decades, a short time by comparison to Mr. Porter. Uh, he has written or co-written songs for numerous artists, including Leanne uh, Warrack, Tim McGraw, my favorite, uh, uh, McBride, Josh Turner, and a host of others. His songwriting and producing talents were recognized by not one, but two Grammy Awards and an ACM Award and a CMA Award for his work on Casey McGrave's album, Golden Hour. Mr. Garrett, Levin. Mr. Levin is the president and chief executive officer of 
the EIMA or the Digital Music Association as we also know it and is, has been an association leader, particularly in the streaming and streaming innovation. Mr. Levin previously served as Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for the Intellectual Property Law and Policy at the National Association of Broadcasters. Before that time, he served as a Senior Counsel for one of my all-time favorites and patent innovator, Senator Patrick Leahy, and as a copyright attorney at the PTO. Uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Molinan, Molinar is the general counsel at Big Machine Music, the publishing arm of Big Machine Label Group. He, is, he has nearly 30 years of experience in the music industry and is, has recently been elected to a third term on the board of the National Music Publishers Association. He also serves on the board for the uh, MLC and as a result, we'll get a lot of questions today. Last and certainly not least, we have Ms. Abby North. Ms. No Ms. North is the president of the North Music Group, which is an independent music rights administrator, and she is a co-founder of the Unclaimed Melody Publishing. She is, has also nearly 30 years of uh, experience in the music publishing and catalog management. Ms. North also serves on the board of the Association of Independent Publishers uh, and, uh, and, and serves on the Los Angeles chapter. We welcome all of our witnesses and pursuant to the rules of this committee, if you could please all rise to take the oath. Your photo moment, even if you don't work for Big Tobacco, is now. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you will give today will be the truth and correct to the best of your knowledge and information, so I hope you got. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. As you probably have heard or seen on C-SPAN over the years, all of your exhaustive written statements and quite candidly additional ideas and information you want us to receive afterwards will be placed in the, in the record. It will be left open for at least five days after this hearing, which means that your five minutes, your precious first five minutes, uh, should be used for those things that may not fit neatly within your opening statement, but you want to get them out before we begin uh, our line of, of questioning. So with that, uh, I guess uh, I've got uh, Mr. R, I've got these things in backwards order, but we'll, you, is it left to right or right to left? Okay. Mr. Aaron. For purposes of our streaming audience, if you could get this as close as possible with the red light looking at you, you will be very much appreciated. You got it. Good morning. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, uh, Members Klein, Fitzgerald, and Nadler. Um, it is, uh, well, my name is Chris Arend. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the MLC. And it is my pleasure to share with you today the progress we have made toward fulfilling the vision and statutory mandates set out in the MMA, which as several of you as have already noted this morning, uh, Congress passed unanimously in 2018 with the support of an historically broad coalition of industry stakeholders. The creation of the MLC was a key part of Congress's vision to modernize the compulsory licensing system for musical works in the United States and to usher in a new era of more effective, accurate, and transparent royalty administration. That system assigns specific responsibilities to each of our key stakeholder groups. The MLC often refers to this framework of shared responsibility as playing your part, and it reflects a key tenet of the MMA that improving the system would depend upon the continued participation by and collaboration among all stakeholders. So how are things working? Happily, I can report that after only two and a half years of full operations, the MLC is making things better, just as Congress intended. Here are just a few of the metrics that evidence our progress to date. We've enrolled more than 28,000 members, the large majority of whom are smaller independent publishers and administrators, as well as self-administered songwriters, many of whom were likely not participating in the system before the MMA was passed. We have established and maintain a public database that contains ownership information for more than 31 million musical works. 
We've helped nearly 60 digital services secure the blanket license. We have completed 27 monthly royalty distributions on time or early, and we have never missed a distribution. We have distributed well over $1 billion in royalties, and we have achieved historically high match rates and high distribution rates while providing this unprecedented level of transparency. We've accomplished all of this while seeking to engage as many stakeholders as possible, and we've done that in a variety of ways, including by hosting or attending hundreds of virtual and in-person events, which have enabled us to reach nearly 30,000 stakeholders from every state in the country, by providing one-on-one -on -one support through our support team, which has responded to nearly 60,000 inquiries to date, by regularly meeting with songwriters, publishers, administrators, and other CMOs of all kinds to help them better understand how our processes work and how to use the tools we've created for them more effectively. And finally, by meeting regularly with a wide variety of groups that represent the many different stakeholders we serve to ensure that we are always receiving direct and unfiltered feedback from the broadest possible cross-section of our industry. That said, by no means are we done. Each month, we continue to work hard to enhance and improve our existing operations based on the feedback we receive directly from our members. We are also actively preparing to tackle two significant challenges that involve the streaming rates for the five-year period between 2018 and 22. These rates are just now being finalized by the Copyright Royalty Board and the Copyright Office. Once these final rates take effect, digital services will have six months under the existing regulations to deliver any new data and adjusted royalties required by the final rates. Once the MLC has received that new data, the first thing we will be able to do is begin distributing matched historical royalties from 2018, 19, and 20, plus interest from the date we received those royalties from the services. That is because we have already matched nearly 70% of the historical royalties reported to us for those years. Taken together with the historical uses from earlier periods, we have already matched nearly 300 million of the historical royalties that DSPs were not previously able to pay. And we will continue our efforts to try to match even more of the remaining historical royalties in the months to come. At the same time, our members can continue to search that data themselves and propose matches to the works they have registered. This is possible because the MLC has fully illuminated the black box of digital audio mechanicals for the first time in history by making all of the data for both the remaining unmatched historical royalties and the remaining unmatched blanket royalties that we've received available for any of our members to search and act upon using our matching tool. The second thing the MLC will be able to do is start processing adjustments for the blanket royalties from 2021 and 22 that we previously distributed at the lower interim rates. Once this very complex reconciliation process is completed, we expect to be able to distribute a substantial amount of additional blanket royalties to rights holders for those two years. I'll close by my remarks uh, by saying that it has been both the privilege and the challenge of my lifetime for me to have played a part uh, in helping build the MLC. Please know that our entire team, our board, our advisory committees, and countless others have worked tirelessly and in good faith over the past few years to try to make your vision for the MLC a reality. And we remain equally committed to building on the milestones we've achieved as we continue this important work in the future and make the MLC better. Thank you for inviting me here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Now, I'm afraid your red light isn't lit. Now, again. You're, now you're in business. <laughs> thank you, Chairman Issa and uh, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. I'll skip over the credit information that you said about me and get to the guts of what I You've only got five say. minutes. You'd yes. never make it all. <laughs> I won't even try. Thank you for coming to Nashville for this important field hearing. It's a great place, Music City, to hear firsthand what's happening in music from songwriters, musicians, and executives and experts. I'd like to, you to check out my hometown of Memphis, Tennessee as well. I understand one of the, the purposes of your visit is to learn more about the impact of Music Modernization Act. Thank you for passing that landmark bill. Like a great song, the MMA benefits so many people in so many unique ways, many of whom have no idea just how much work it took to create. But whether you're a music creator or a legislator, the goal is to make something worthwhile that will endure and change lives. And that's exactly what the MMA has done. For recording artists, including many of the greats I've worked with early in my career at Stax Records, the key provision is found in Title II of the MMA, also known as the Classics Act. Because of a quirk in copyright law, recording artists were generally denied streaming royalties for music recorded before February 15, 1972. That includes some of the classic music of all time. Motown greats like Smokey Robinson, sax greats like Otis Redding, Al Green of High Records, and country greats like Johnny Cash and Patsy Cline and rock and roll legends like Chuck, Chuck Berry and Wilson Pickett. 
It was totally arbitrary and unfair. In the mid-60s, I wrote a song called Soul Man. Sam and Dave recorded it, won a Grammy in 1968. But when that classic recording was streamed before the MMA passed, neither Sam Moore nor Dave Prater's estate received any royalties. Even crazier, when later covers of the song, like Soul Man, like the John Blue Sedan Aykroyd Blues Brothers recording made in 1970, when that was, was streamed, there was a royalty payment for those performers. The classic act sections of the MMA changed that protecting legacy artists and ensuring they get paid when their timeless music is streamed. MMA made other changes benefiting artists and songwriters. It created Mechanical Licensing Collective that is streamlining digital royalties for songwriters and making life a lot easier for streaming services, too. It bought more music under the fair market rate standards, replacing outdated standards that pay below market royalties for so satellite radio and other uses of music. Though that was needed, more still needs to be done. It certainly paved the way for producers to get their fair share in royalties, creating a process for artists to instruct song exchange to pay them directly. I don't have to tell you that MMA success was in no way assured. As we all know, copyright law, when not looked into, becomes permanent. It took the entire industry, artists, songwriters, labels, publishers, producers, collecting societies, digital platforms, and others working together to make this historic change. It is a testament to the fact that when the music community comes together and Congress acts with certainty and strength, it can make a real difference. That experience may serve us well facing the upcoming challenges of artificial intelligence. Today, huge AI computer models are copy, copying and analyzing virtually all of the music ever made to generate what they are calling new songs from the music industry of yesterday. Hopefully, courts will see that copyright law does not allow this. AI platforms and services must get permission before right holders work can be copied and used in this way, though. So far, very few have done so. No one at any AI company has spoken to me, my label, or my publishing company. This is wrong. But our concerns extend beyond copyright. There's no greater honor than to have an audience enjoy my music, but key to that appreciation is that it's my music. To have someone or something take my voice, my sound, my persona without permission, and manipulate or mimic my work in a personal, is a personal violation and a threat to the good I've built up over the years. How can this be new when this has been taken from songs written years ago? How is that new? I know I speak for a great many songwriters who feel this way. I do believe there's a place for AI, but, appear to be, but we appear to be going down a path of appropriation, exploitation, and dehumanization. I've been the benefactor of a great number of people who have taken my songs and sampled them. They, may, they have my permission, they pay royalties, and they create something that adds a, a fresh in, in, intention of my original work. This is not currently the case for the majority of AI-generated songs. It's not just a threat to existing works, but to future generations of artists to co and to culture itself. If all we have is machine-made music copied from existing work, there will be less and less creativity, artistry, and soul to go around. What a penalty that would be for future generations. What a shame. Congress and the Coast must assure the guardrails are in place to protect creators' rights and their control over their own work. You have a model in the MMA process to make things right. Bring in the music family together with your own policy and legal expertise to shape strong rules for healthy uses of AI. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Thank you. With one second to spare, Mr. Porter. <laughs> Mr. Tashian. Hello, uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, uh, Ranking Member Nadler, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Klein, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to speak about the Music Modernization Act. Uh, my name is Daniel Tashian. I'm a songwriter, producer, musician, and artist. Um, as you mentioned, I've worked with Tim McGraw, Demi Lovato, and the legendary Burt Backrack. I won two Grammy Awards for my work with Casey Musgraves. I'm also a member of the Recording Academy, which represents thousands of music creators like me. The MMA was a landmark piece of legislation that reflected years of work by members of Congress, stakeholders, and individual music creators, and I personally benefited uh, by all aspects of the law. Uh, as a songwriter, I'm grateful that the MMA changed the way that we are paid by streaming services. This bill uh, reformed a previously unreliable and opaque system into one that provides transparency and accountability. Uh, since 2021, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC, has paid out over a billion dollars in royalties, as you mentioned, um, and achieved a matching rate of nearly 90%. Uh, these are remarkable outcomes that should encourage every songwriter. I'm personally grateful for the work of the MLC, but even with this incredible progress, there are still uh, opportunities to improve. Uh, first, 
the MLC is still holding on to hundreds of millions of dollars in historically unmatched royalties. They must continue their outreach efforts to identify every songwriter who has money owed to them. The MMA requires that any unmatched money will eventually be paid out by market share, but importantly, it gives the MLC the flexibility to take the time necessary to match the royalties to the correct songwriter, including those who may be unidentified because they're independent or unaffiliated with a major publisher. Second, now that we have finally resolved the dispute over the Copyright Royalty Board's Phono Records 3 rate decision, the MLC must work expeditiously to collect and distribute the back pay owed by the streaming services to songwriters. The law is clear that once the final ruling is published in the Federal Register, the DSPs have six months to pay the additional royalties they owe. The songwriters have waited long enough. Third, Congress should remember that the MMA contemplated a robust oversight role for Congress and the U.S. Copyright Office over the operations of the MLC. The MLC is an administrative body, not a policy-making body. Recent disputes over songwriter termination rights illustrate that Congress and the Copyright Office must continue to stay engaged to protect the rights and interests of songwriters. But the MMA does more than reform royalty payments for songwriters. I'm grateful to have a letter of direction in place under the AMP Act, which recognized the important role of producers, engineers, and mixers in copyright law. This, pro this provision codified the LOD process by which producers can collect their share of digital royalties directly through SoundExchange, an important partner and friend to our community. To make it easier for producers and engineers who don't have management teams to help them navigate the paperwork, the LOD application process should be streamlined and improved, and additionally, the artist community should be encouraged to more widely adopt these agreements and the payments Sound Exchange facilitates. Finally, I want to briefly mention the last part of the MMA, the Classics Act, authored by Chairman Issa, which provides for the payment of digital royalties for recordings created prior to 1972. I have a personal connection because my father, Barry Tashin, led the Epic Records Act, Barry and the Remains, who opened for the Beatles on their 1966 U.S. tour. I applaud Congress for ensuring that my family and other legacy artists are now fairly compensated for their tracks. In conclusion, the MMA represents a generational reform of music law. It also represents a sea change in the relationship between the music community and Congress. For music makers like me, we saw that you were willing to take the time to learn about our complicated and often messy business. I hope this work serves as a foundation and we can continue to work together to solve the challenges that still face us. Whether it's resolving the historic inequity of performance royalties for artists on broadcast radio or ensuring a fair CRB rate setting process for songwriters, I am hopeful for what we can achieve together. On behalf of the songwriters, producers, and artists like me, we are counting on you to look out for our interests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tashian. And now I'll go to Mr. Levin. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, Ranking Mem Member Nadler, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today at this important hearing on the Music Modernization Act at five years. My name is Garrett Levin, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Digital Media Association, or DEMA, which represents the world's leading audio streaming services. The MMA was and continues to be necessary for today's music ecosystem. The key provisions of the law including the blanket mechanical license, the centralized authoritative database, limitation on liability, and extensive reporting requirements, create efficiency in licensing and royalty payments, and provide legal certainty. And the law is fundamentally working. But five years is a key moment to step back, acknowledge the extraordinary resources and co cooperation that went into creating the MLC and this new licensing system, and to examine where challenges remain. My written testimony provides more detail, but I hope to leave the committee with two key takeaways. First, I applaud Chris Aaron and the entire team at the MLC, as well as my colleagues across the industry, including my fellow MLC board members here today, like Mike Molinar, who have been and remain committed partners to the success of this improved system. The results Chris cited in his testimony are truly impressive, and the MMA is a model of how together we can solve hard problems for the benefit of all. Second, we should continue to diligently identify areas for improvement to reach the full potential and intention of the MMA, including two I will focus on today. Ensuring that regulatory and statutory positions reflect the MMA's critical balance and ensuring that the MLC's budget is reasonable and cost-effective. 
The MLC sits at the heart of the MMA's blanket mechanical license system. In its best form, the MLC can serve as a neutral level seat of a three-legged stool, administering the blanket license system in an effort to balance the interests of three sets of stakeholders, songwriters, music publishers, and digital streaming services. A neutral administrator and best-in-class back-office service provider that processes massive amounts of data provided by digital music services, provides a one-stop authoritative shop for rights holders to register their works in a centralized public database, matches more works to sound recordings than previously possible, and effectively and efficiently pays out hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties every year to publishers who in turn pay songwriters. In the first year of operations in particular, the MLC worked bilaterally with services to ensure they successfully transitioned to the new system. Unfortunately, on broad interpretations of the statute and regulations, we have seen several instances where the MLC has acted not as a neutral partner, but rather as arbiter or advocate on behalf of the music publishers, just one leg of the stool. Instead of siding with any one stakeholder, the MLC should seek clarification from the Copyright Office and rely on the authority the MMA granted to the office. To do otherwise is contrary to congressional intent and produces results that distort the necessary balance of the statutory licensing, licensing regime in light of the MLC's power over all stakeholders. Guidance from this committee to ensure that the MLC acts as a neutral administrator will help to advance the goals of the MMA and improve the system for all. This need for neutrality is paramount given the unique funding structure of the MLC, which requires that licensees pay for the costs of the MLC's operations on top of their royalty obligations. This structure has actually led to the absurd circumstance that the services are paying for both their own advocacy costs and the MLC's costs in advancing arguments often indistinguishable from the music publishers. That was not the intention of the MMA. Twice now, the services have agreed to fund the costs of the MLC at the amount requested, even as those costs increase significantly. The MMA explicitly provides that the services are responsible only for the reasonable costs of running the collective. The MMA did not hand the MLC a blank check. The true measure of reasonableness will be material improvements in efficiency and effectiveness at the MLC's core functions. Are more royalty-bearing works registered? Are more works matched? Are more royalties paid through to the rights owners? And is all of that done with increasing efficiency and effectiveness over time? Regular review by Congress of budgeting and spending against ongoing performance improvements will help ensure that the law lives up to its full potential and help the parties avoid inefficient and expensive litigation over costs before the Copyright Royalty Board. The MMA was a major stride forward in improving music licensing for the digital market. DEMA and its members were proud to be a central part of the law's passage, and we continue to support the law. Our member companies interact with the MLC on a near constant basis, and we believe that they, like us, fundamentally want to improve the system. DEMA's members want the MLC to succeed. More than that, they need the MLC to succeed. When the MMA passed Congress, it was described on multiple occasions as a once-in-a-generation measure to improve the licensing system for all stakeholders. Five years in, we continue to believe that is true. I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Molinar. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> My name is Mike Molinar, and I'm the president of Big Machine Music, a leading independent music publisher based here in Nashville. I'm also a current and founding board member of the Mechanical Licensing Collective designated by the U.S. Copyright Office. I'm honored to appear before you today and provide my perspective as an independent music publisher on the Music Modernization Act. As a music publisher, I am responsible for representing songwriters, the authors of musical works, and helping to develop their careers, exploit their songs, and then collect and pay them royalties when those songs are used. It was during my college internship 27 years ago, just down the street, where I discovered a job in music publishing, what music publishing entailed. I was immediately hooked at the idea of working with the musical magicians who write the soundtrack of our lives and whose hits are the bedrock of the entire music industry. That fall, I began my first job in publishing as a catalog manager and worked my way up at, to a creative publishing executive, eventually starting my own independent music publishing companies. For the past 11 years, I've been proud to serve as the head of Big Machine Music, which I launched at the request of music industry titan Scott Borchetta. Thanks to Mr. Borchetta, our team, and most importantly, a roster of songwriter partners that, I, that are among the very best in the world, Big Machine Music has thrived and prospered. While developing songwriters and generating opportunities for their songs is a big part of the equation, ensuring that our songwriters receive royalties when their songs are used and reporting to our writers on a timely and accurate basis remains our core function. That is where the MMA and the Mechanical Licensing Collective that it created come into play. Musical work rights are complicated, and many of our rights are regulated by government. 
Prior to the passage of the MMA, the collection of royalties under Section 115 of the Copyright Act at times felt like an Easter egg hunt in a carnival funhouse maze of mirrors. The process required sending paper licenses called NOIs for every licensed composition. This worked when 10 songs were licensed for a record or CD, but it became impossible to administer once 10 million songs or more were licensed by digital music providers such as Spotify. Attempting to collect royalties meant registering with multiple third-party vendors. There was no transparency, so the system was ripe for abuse and unlicensed use of our works were frequent. There was no guarantee of song data being correct, of timely payment of royalties, and virtually no recourse unless we were willing to bring a costly legal action. For an independent company, the administrative burden was stressful for us and harmed the financial welfare of our writers. Thanks to Congress's leadership and unanimous support, our industry was provided with historic changes in the MMA, including necessary reform to the way our rights are licensed, administered, and paid through the creation of the MLC. In exchange for a blanket license for all works played on their platforms, digital music providers now fully fund a centralized, transparent, and rights holder run collective that allows music publishers and songwriters assurance that they receive compensation for uses of their songs. As a publisher, I am here to tell you today that the MLC you helped to create is working and working well. Despite an aggressive timeline set by the statute and through a global pandemic, the MLC was developed from scratch and launched on time. Since April 2021, rights holders have received monthly payments of our mechanical royalties, and these payments have been on time every month. With a fully public database, we have critical transparency into song ownership data, song uses, and income sources for the first time. Through a centralized claiming portal, we can claim and match our works, giving us the control we need. Through their engaged customer service, we have helped to guide us through the process. Finally, the MLC's right to audit to ensure proper payments and to bring legal action to enforce rights benefits all publishers, but especially independent music publishers such as Big Machine Music. Make no mistake, there is effort necessary from each publisher and administrator to make the MLC and its new blanket license work. It is why the MLC promotes the slogan of play your part. Through the onboarding process, publishers like me can maintain the fidelity of their ownership information, make corrections where necessary, and discover discrepancies. In short, it has made our data better and more reliable, which means better payments to our songwriters. I can attest that Big Machine Music has seen an increase in royalty collection due to the direct efforts of the MLC. As a founding board member, I'm here to tell you that being a small part of building the MLC is one of the greatest privileges of my career. It is rare to have an opportunity to start an entity of this magnitude from scratch and get it right, which is a responsibility felt by everyone involved. The MLC's board is a mix of songwriters, independent and major publishers, representing all genres of music and from across the United States. The contributions from all board members have been robust and respectful in line with the statute passed by Congress and with recognition of the importance of the success of the MLC for the entire ecosystem of our industry. Thank you again for passing the MMA five years ago and for your attention to it today. Thank you, Ms. Norman, or Ms. North. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm an independent music publisher, songwriter advocate, and technologist. My husband's father was a composer named Alex North. With High Zeret, Alex wrote the 1955 standard, Unchained Melody. When our families had a worldwide recapture of rights in Unchained Melody, we joined various foreign collectives and I learned global music publishing. I was able to view and correct data and increase our royalty collections. Soon, other legacy songwriters and their families asked if I would administer their works as well. When I first heard about the MMA and, and blanket mechanical license, I was pleased and hopeful. I believed and was promised that the intention of the MMA was for a new authoritative gold standard database to be engineered with aggressively vetted musical work and sound recording data. The MLC Inc. became the first MLC and engaged the Harry Fox Agency as its data and operations vendor. HFA has been integral to the music business since 1927, but one data set is not enough. The MLC must license data from many providers. To my knowledge, the promised new MLC database and new data set don't exist. The MLC uses slogans like play your part to drive music publishers to sign up with the MLC and confirm the MLC's data. But it seems that playing our part means doing the MLC's job and devoting our own resources to the tasks that the DSPs pay the MLC to do. A major part of the MLC's mandated role is to match sound recordings to musical works. 
If a recording isn't correctly matched, the publisher and songwriter don't receive mechanical royalties. Per the MLC, Unchained Melody has been recorded by more than 30,000 artists. To perform due diligence, I asked the MLC for a list of those recordings, but was told it wasn't possible to export. I was told if I had access to the MLC's data dump, then I could go find the information. Well, fortunately, I do have access to that data dump. I paid thousands of dollars to create a database that allows me to analyze that data in order to identify gaps and errors. I reviewed matches on behalf of my clients. For one well-known legacy song, 11% of the sound recording to composition matches were wrong. For another, 20% were wrong. After the MMA passed, the DSPs transferred roughly $424 million in unallocated black box royalties to the MLC. If I register my works with the MLC, my money shouldn't be in that black box. But sometimes I have co-publishers who deliver different data about our shared work that might overwrite my data. Sometimes I don't know about a recording of the work. And foreign and domestic songwriters, they may not know about the MLC. All CMOs have data gaps and errors, but by statute, the MLC is mandated to aggressively apply its resources to reduce that black box. We must prevent the wrong parties from receiving Phono Records 3 royalties, which apparently will soon be distributed. Some US publishers are even engaging the Canadian collective CMRA for a fee to fix their problems at the MLC. I've never heard of one collective cleaning another collective's data. Another problem I have with the MLC involves misclaimed copyright shares by independent artists who distribute music and deliver data through aggregators. At least on a monthly basis, I must play whack-a-mole, searching the MLC's portal to find new registrations of our work that make no mention of Alex North, not High Zeret, and not our publishing entities. And when I claim these infringing registrations at the MLC, my underlying registration goes into suspense. To make the above even more complicated, there's no claim overlap or dispute resolution portal within the MLC's website. The MLC has the opportunity to create truly innovative products, including at least a basic claim and overlap portal. The MLC must stop creating unilateral business rules. The terminations decision made by the MLC to ignore that the derivative work exception doesn't apply in the context of Section 115 would have benefited the major publishers who control the bulk of legacy copyrights. It would have harmed songwriters and their families. Fortunately, the Copyright Office stepped in to correct. The MLC has made unilateral decisions regarding how it treats public domain works. It invoices the DSPs for streams of these public domain works, but no publisher is entitled to these royalties. I want the MLC to succeed, and we all need it to succeed. The MLC must perform its mandated duty to create an authoritative dase, database that is best gold standard. The MLC must stop making unilateral decisions that affect the lives of songwriters and music publishers. If there's a question regarding a law, regulation, or internal policy, the Copyright Office must be consulted. Until we have our gold standard authoritative database, songwriters are being harmed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we'll, go, now we'll go to our first round of questioning, and I'll go to the gentleman from Wisconsin first, Mr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Molinar, uh, I continue, I think other people continue to believe that more can be done to improve data throughout the music industry, uh, including the public performance rights. Um, it, it's my understanding that performance and mechanical rights data is typically identical or near identical, I think, which came up in the opening statements. Uh, from your perspective, do you think having PRO affiliation included in the MLC database would help companies like Big Machine get accurate payments from, P from the PROs and the MLC uh, and certainly probably enhance transparency as well? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, <clears throat> I, th I think to touch on the what the MLC is doing right, where as, as we, ha we can attest, the publishers, as we're entering it in and cleaning up our data, this database is heading towards being the cleanest database that exists. Um, unfortunately, I think that the, the complicated landscape of um, these royalties, especially I, I wasn't around for the decision of when a uh, streaming mechanical royalty was decided to be split into a performance and a uh, mechanical. 
um, which just makes things all the more difficult and complicated. Um, but you know, I think that is a, I wish I could answer more to the question of could we get that done? Could it, made it make it, um, uh, do I think that we are on the right path of the, at the MLC of creating a pretty authoritative uh, song data because of the way that, that publishers can interact with their own data and see what is being claimed? You know, much to Ms. North's comments, the reason she can play whack-a-mole on uh, issues that come up from new songwriters via aggregators is because she can see it and that you can, you, you, we have that ability to act on it. The transparency. Uh, the part. transparency right. part of this is something right. that we haven't had, particularly when we were, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, when you had third party vendors representing each of the different streaming services, we just didn't have that transparency into it. So, you know, I, I, I can't speak to um, the functions of some of our other um, organizations such as PROs, uh, the MLC by statute is not allowed to, to collect performance royalties. Um, um, so I think we're just concentrated on getting the data right for our, the, the purpose via that's under the statute. Very good, thank you for that. Mr. Aaron, um, I think we're aware that the different stakeholders may have different interpretations of the statute or regulations. And uh, that at times the MLC has weighed in, obviously, on that. Um, rather than weigh in on those specific circumstances, has the MLC considered identifying for the Copyright Office that there are stakeholders with differing views and asking the Copyright Office to share its position? Yes. Thank you for the question. You're like, your mic. Thank you, um, Mr. Vichel, for the question. We speak regularly with the Copyright Office, and, um, and we talk uh, with them about the operational challenges we face and the issues that we see and hear from our members. <clears throat> um, the terminations issue is a great example. Um, the MLC raised that issue in regulatory proceedings the Copyright Office held in 2019 and 20, and we pointed out that we um, did not see that issue addressed by the MMA and that there was not a clear answer um, on the law, and we asked the Copyright Office to weigh in on that issue at the time. They declined to do so. We then uh, sought a rule that would give us a data point that we could use to implement the policy we ultimately did. So I think we do try to flag issues for the office, and, um, and we welcome their guidance where they're willing to give it. And in the meantime, um, we try our best to um, put in place operational processes that don't decide um, uh, questions of um, legal rights, but simply serve to um, come up with an operational plan in the interim that will work for our members. Very good, thank you. Mr. Tashian, um, how do record labels compensate their artists and how does the money flow in and out of what can be seen, uh, like the black box, I think, that we were talking about earlier? Are artists receiving kind of reciprocal increases in their streaming and, and also in the digital service deals that, that currently exist? Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really here as a producer and a songwriter. Um, I am also an artist, but the uh, level of my streaming is not uh, on the level of some of the uh, artists that you might be more interested to see how it, how it has um, benefited them uh, financially. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's where I, I think what we're trying to establish is just, you know, is, is the streaming portion of this functioning correctly right now? I think in some ways, um, I think, um, you know, there is that five year, uh, 2018 to 22, um, that I know as a songwriter, uh, I'm still sort of waiting on, on that, uh, the difference between what the rate was and what it is agreed on now. So yeah, I'm still waiting on that. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Should you. Back? The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The COVID-19 pandemic was devastating for many Americans, but artists were some of the hardest hit in this country because live venues all shut down. This meant that artists had to rely largely on their royalties from streaming services in order to stay afloat. Mr. Porter, can you describe what this experience was like and whether artists can earn a living on streaming royalties alone? Presently, I don't feel that they can. I mean, the numbers clearly are not as fair as I, 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 I feel that they should be as it relates to the contribution that artists make 
to the well-being and the balance that people feel about their daily lives. And so I think that certainly should be much, much, much done to, to bring that, that kind of income level up to a point where people can feel comfortable with, with wanting to do it tomorrow in the next day. So no, we're, I don't feel that we're, we're there yet. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tashian, what can you add to that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a good thing to be, um, well, uh, a producer and uh, a songwriter because the combined income of both of those things makes it possible for me to have a family. And, and um, I think it's to be just only a songwriter, you would have to be in the top, you know, five or ten percent, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say to really make make a living? So yeah. Thank you. Uh, what would you say has been the biggest success of the MMA, and what has been the biggest challenge that you have faced since the law came into effect, Ms. North? Um, so the, the success of this project. This your your microphone. Thank you. The success is really, in my opinion, um, to the blanket mechanical license. The previous method of one by one licensing absolutely didn't work. So the blanket license brings us in parity with the rest of the world licensing model. That was excellent. The MLC is doing many things right, but the, uh, the statute requires it or promises it to be the gold standard, best in class. So it's good but we need better. The uh, Classics Act, no question, that was a huge, huge benefit to performers and owners of you know, those pre-1972 recordings. And I think the codification of the LOD process at Sound Exchange unquestionably, unquestionably is a true benefit. Thank you, Mr. Molinar. Yes, I, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would agree uh, with Ms. North um, that being able to, um, the MLC has provided this opportunity to have one stop, you know, one, one place for your data for all of these services. Um, and again, as we've repeated, uh, being able to be in control of your data and having that, uh, you know, that transparency to it. Honestly, our challenges, uh, as, as has been mentioned here, um, was the timing of the statute. We had a very short window. This is a technology company that meets creators. Um, it, it is such a unique institution, and we, and we put it up in a, in a year and a half, two years, um, through a global pandemic. So it, it will continue to uh, get better, but the fact that, that it is receiving, doing the match rates that it's doing it, um, and Mr. Aaron can speak to this a little bit more, but you know, in some reprocessing, they're getting over 90% match, and, and this just started in uh, April of 2021. Um, you know, this is, it's an incredible job that, that it's already been, that's already been done. I think the other challenge is just, has been touched on, is the timing of the CRB, uh, the waiting for uh, five years and 130 plus days to get final rates, which came in last Thursday um, for, you know, after the, the period of time that that should have covered. Um, and we can spend more time on that if you, if you prefer, but that is incredibly frustrating and in incredibly um, uh, disruptive to, right. to my business. Okay, thank you. Mr. Levin. Thank you for the question. And, and let me just note for, for one second on the, on the uh, streaming compensation question, if I might, that uh, the services pay roughly 70% of their revenue out to their rights holder partners across labels and publishers. And it's those entities that pe then pay songwriters and, and, uh, and recording artists. And you know we are very proud to have been part of the the settlement, uh, reaching the highest rates ever for mechanical rates going forward for this period and the next and and moving forward. And so the conversations around streaming economics are important to have and have on a holistic level. From the MMA perspective, I think from the services, I would I would I would join uh, with with Mr. Molinar's uh, comments about the database and the benefits of the database. But from the services perspective, it's really that legal certainty of being able to know that you have that blanket license. The prior system simply didn't work. Okay, and challenges. And on the challenges front, I really do think to, to steal, sorry, to steal a line from Mr. Tashin's testimony, I think it's navigating that line for the MLC between administering the license and setting policy and rules. One is what the MMA intended, and the other actually goes beyond what they're supposed to do. All right, thank you, Mr. Aaron, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question. Uh, like the other panelists, I think the fact that we've been able to set up 
um, the MLC begin operations and, um, and to do that without missing deadlines um, consistently month after month is, um, is, a, is a huge accomplishment and it's a huge shared accomplishment. Um, hundreds, thousands of people have been a part of that. Um, on the challenges side, um, there are many. You've heard already um, from other witnesses here today, uh, there are lots of areas where we can continue to do more to improve the system. Um, we as an organization are committed to improving. Um, that's why we talk so regularly with so many stakeholders. We want to understand what works and what doesn't so that we can continue to make the organization better and to make it function more effectively for the benefit of those members. Thank, Thank you. you. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman. We go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to follow up on this last uh, line of questioning. Mr. Aaron, we are talking about the uh, database error rates. Can you say with certainty over the last a uh, couple of years since you've started that the error rates have gone down or are they consistently in the 11 percent range that Ms. North was talking about and what steps are you taking to address those? Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, our ability to match uh, data, um, we are matching at a higher uh, rate, higher percentage than ever before. Um, there are errors um, uh, in the data that we receive and, um, and there are sometimes errors in, in the matches we make. Um, and we monitor that actively. We give our members tools that allow them to see where those um, may exist, and then we do our best to fix them quickly. Uh, we manage a massive uh, amount of data, 31 million works and data from well over 100 million sound recordings um, and many, many more millions of products derived from those sound recordings. So it is a massive undertaking, um, and, um, and we do monitor to try to make it better. How do you respond to Ms. North's comments about uh, needing to be that gold standard and having to utilize the Canadian system to address uh, problems within our own system? Uh, we absolutely aspire to be the gold standard, no doubt, and, um, and that is not easy. Um, one of the benefits of, of making our data so widely available, um, and we do that not, not only through the public search, um, the matching tool, but uh, the bulk uh, data subscription program that the MMA required us to set up. Um, close to 200 organizations around the world now uh, regularly download a full snapshot of all of the ownership data on the musical work side that we make available and the sound recording data. So they essentially get all of the information they need to look for errors and then to, um, to help people find and act on them. Um, those companies are using that access to create um, businesses where they can offer services to other companies that may prefer to utilize those services um, as opposed to doing it themselves. So um, organizations like the one that um, Ms. North mentioned are taking advantage of the very transparency that you sought to create to provide a richer, more vibrant marketplace where people have access to services like that. Um, that is not a negative comment on the MLC. That just means that more people are involved in the process of making the data better, and that is, in fact, what is happening. Switching gears, I understand that royalty funds may be invested, but have royalty funds actually been used for this purpose? And if so, how will the MLC handle any profits or losses stemming from investments? Royalties are never used to fund our operations. 100% of our operating costs are funded separately by the DSPs through an assessment process. The unpaid royalties that <clears throat> we have accrued, um, we hold, um, and, um, and we hold them until we are able to pay out the underlying royalties, and then we pay those royalties with interest. Um, the monies that we hold are invested conservatively um, through institutional financial firms um, in, in, uh, um, in financial um, uh, uh, investments intended to deliver the rate of return the statute requires um, while minimizing risk as much as possible. Um, that is not an easy task, but uh, it is one that we have undertaken. Um, we monitor it carefully. We work with outside fee-based advisors who have no financial benefit in the process either to ensure that we're doing that as effectively as possible. Are the board members participating in that process, in that decision-making process, or is that a decision-making process that you are um, solely in charge of? No, the, the, the board uh, is fully uh, involved in that process. Um, they um, adopted a policy, an investment policy that guides um, how, we, um, how we hold those monies, and we update them regularly on our progress as do the advisors that we've hired. Do you make public that information as well? <clears throat> we have not made public the investment policy because the policy contains not only the parameters that I just described, um, but also the specific guidance that our advisors have given us on where to invest the money. And um, they advised us that it is not um, good for security purposes or for market manipulation purposes to make public uh, the information about where we're investing the money. 
Mr. Levin, um, I understand there's no mechanism other than litigation to resolve conflicts or adjudicate a substantive resolution or of disputes. From DEMA's perspective, is there a legislative solution that Congress should be looking to in order to resolve this issue? Uh, thank you for the question. Do you mean disputes as between a service and uh, the, the MLC? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a great question. I, I don't know that there are legislative improvements that need to be undertaken here. I think if there is guidance to the MLC about um, where there might be policy disputes as between um, the, the copyright owners on the one hand and the services on the other hand, or between the um, publishers and the songwriters, that rather than impose kind of a unilateral decision, that they instead seek guidance from the Copyright Office, which has broad regulatory authority under the MMA explicitly granted to effectuate the, the purposes of the statute. We think that would help, that the tools are already there um, to avoid some of that costly litigation, particularly in a scenario where the services are funding the MLC's operations and might find themselves potentially in a litigation where they are paying for both sides of the litigation, that, that does seem to uh, be contrary to what uh, Congress intended through the MMA. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Nadler. Thank you. Uh my question I'd like to address to as many of the witnesses as can address it in the five minutes I have. New technologies like artificial intelligence can present great opportunities for creative industries to innovate, but they also present a set of challenges. Can you talk about how AI and other burgeoning technologies are affecting the music industry, and what do you think Congress can do to address these issues? We'll start with Ms. North. Thank you for the question. Um, I believe that uh, there are tremendous opportunities with AI and for creators, for songwriters, for performers, but there also are deep, deep challenges and there's the threat of decimating their careers. To me, the greatest challenge and maybe opportunity we have right now is to come up with a compensation model that's different from anything that's ever we, we've ever seen before. And what I mean is we all have works and sound recordings that are used in the ingestion to train these machine learning and AI generative tools. We need to make sure that not just the material, the, the IP, but, but the creators, that they're going to be paid for any derivative uses or any derivatives that, that are generated by, these, by this technology. Mr. Molina. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think we need to prioritize human creators as we look at everything. AI is still early, um, early days, but it's, move, it's moving fast. Um, AI training should not be considered fair use, should not be presumptively considered fair use. I saw an operation that um, uh, had spit out songs in the uh, style of Songwriter Hall of Fame, Liz Rose. <clears throat> in order to be able to write like her, the computer must have been fed her songs. Um, that should not um, go on unlicensed, um, nor should it be uncompensated to, to Miss Rose. Um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that where those examples happen, where there it, that is considered infringement, um, and we need to preserve this direct licensing market. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Thanks for the question. It's such a, uh, a massive topic right now and obviously uh, a top of mind for everyone in the industry. From the DEMA perspective, a lot of our focus is on what happens on the output side, less on the kind of input side of the, the training models, and ensuring that whatever rules are, are put into place and developed, that we make clear that, that there is an important data element to this. We've talked a lot about data on this panel already today, and the music industry has long struggled with metadata challenges. MLC is actually bringing a lot of improvement in that area. But one of the things that we hear talked about sometimes in AI is the idea that um, services like DEMA's members should somehow differentiate between AI-generated works and other works. I think absent information about what is AI-generated, absent information about clear lines as between what truly counts as AI versus what counts as human conversations that we're seeing at the Copyright Office around registrability, all of those things are fundamentally going to necessitate clear information that is available and included within the works as they arrive at the services. Um, I think this is an ongoing conversation in the industry, uh, and it's important that as we move forward that we're very clear about the elements of this uh, massive topic that we're talking about and try to address them serially along that continuum. Thank you, Mr. Tashian. Um, 
Yeah, I've been using AI for a long time. I mean, shares, you know, do you believe in life after was a was a first sort of AI hit, you know, because it asked the computer to specify what pitch she was on, you know, uh, which it did. It said, well, I think it should be, you know, on this, which is an algorithm that's built into the Antares software. So AI has been, you know, assisting musicians for decades. Um, and now we're sort of kind of wringing our hands a little bit and saying, you know, what do we do about it? But um, without taking too much time, I've yet to sort of uh, experience an artwork created by a computer that, gives me goosebumps or gives me chills because it's um, so beautiful. So um, until that happens, um, I'm just going to keep my head down and keep doing my best uh, organic music and using computers when they can help. Thank you, Mr. Porter. I can only speak for creatives who, whose main emphasis is to try to do what they feel is, is a positive impact on the public at large about emotions that they don't know how to express through music, but but these people do. And creatives don't want to have to try to figure out what the mechanics are that would be correct for the fairness that they should receive in doing what they do. They rely on others. That's why the relationships that, that, that they have with, with companies, people who say they're the business side of what they do. Uh, I think that, that the fact that uh, if we cannot safeguard the fact that this process can compromise the future generations, their creative motivations to feel that it can be appreciated, respected, and done in a way that won't be compromised by someone else's interpretation or what they feel it should have been, then, then it, 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 it can become extremely, in my opinion, risky to the value of what this whole process of AI, AI can be because you want to have the next generation motivated to want to take a path to do this and if you have a, a method that, that compromises the real legitimacy of that based on what that creative feels, then you're doing something that's counter to what you may perceive as the good that it does. And Thank so you. I, My time's expired, but I'd ask the chair if you'd allow Mr. Aaron to answer the question. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. I, I will say briefly, I agree with the other witnesses. It's imperative that, um, that we ensure that whatever technical, technological developments uh, come down the pipe that we are always protecting the rights of the human creators that um, from which uh, all these works originate. Um, and um, certainly from our perspective, we see a growing correlation between the use of technologies and um, fraudulent activities. So I think it's important that Congress be monitoring that and to make sure that we have um, clear um, and stiff penalties in place for people who uh, choose to use technology for fraudulent or other inappropriate purposes rather than to um, elevate creative works. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. And because of all the good work done so far, as long as I don't blow it, we'll have a second lightning round. I want to announce for everyone to get your questions ready. Uh, this has been a, a, good, uh, a good process so far, but I think Ms. North uh, pointed out a number of, of deep concerns, and I, I want to cover a couple of them because I, I think, uh, you know, in, in baseball, if you hit a 700, you know, they don't even have a place in the Hall of Fame for somebody who's doing that well. And 900, amazing. But if you're part of that hundreds of millions of dollars stranded or you're finding yourself frustrated because you know you're entitled to money and not getting it, then then the batting average doesn't matter. But I want to I want to start with one point, Mr. Ahern. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you're a neutral arbitrator. You're designed to be not in anyone's pocket, but in fact, to fairly match up the places where the dollars should go and getting them there. And so I, I have one question, which is, uh, you're currently using uh, the same outside counsel as the NMPA. Uh, do you think that, at least from a visual standpoint, that that was a good choice? And do you think that the, the appearance of not being in any one side's pocket needs to be taken further. Thank you for your question. Um, we have uh, relied on outside counsel with strong experience um, in this area to build the organization. Um, that was imperative. Um, the, the number of, of lawyers and law firms that work in this particular part of the business is very small. Um, uh, outside the lawyers we use, um, there are a handful of others that the digital services use, so I think it would be very difficult for us to find lawyers um, with that level of knowledge and experience who were not already aligned with one uh, group uh, of stakeholders. Um, 
that said, um, we do uh, strive uh, to um, implement uh, the MMA in every way uh, to the best of our ability in a way that serves the need of all of our stakeholders. And I constantly talk with the digital services about that. We want this to work for them as well as um, for all the other rights holders involved. So I think we've done our best to, um, to uh, uh, I guess, uh, stick toward the middle of that road, recognizing though that there are times and the MMA does envision that our job is to advocate for the process um, and to make sure that the digital services are living up to their obligations under the law. So um, I don't think it's accurate to suggest that we should never be in a situation where we are um, adverse to the services. I like to think we are helping them um, meet the very high bar you have set, and we do that in part by being transparent with them um, about expectations and, and also making sure that where a few of them are doing things differently from the others, um, that those outliers um, come into the fold and um, and perform um, in the same way that the other services in the market are performing. Now, uh, Ms. North brought up a point that, that I, I'll, I'll key in on, and that is that when, when someone's doing what substantially you're doing, which is database man management, uh, the accuracy of a database and the fact that there will be, uh, if we go back a thousand years to when I was writing software the first time, uh, when the card pops out of that IBM and, you, and it says this didn't work and the whole thing shuts down, uh, as fast as you can get it corrected and back in is important. Overwriting rather than showing a, pair, a pairing error and a resolution process that is uh, communicating back to both parties would seem to be the standard. Ms. North, if I see it correctly, that's not happening. They're not coming back with an air check saying, we have a double claim and each of you knowing who the other is and a resolution process, but rather you can be overwritten. Is that correct? So I think there's two parts. One is that currently that process is entirely um, human, meaning we there are emails. There's an email chain and there's a time frame. There is no actual software. Right, high but, administrative cost. Correct, um, but also functionality. And in terms of um, reducing friction, it takes too long. Right? because we could do it so much faster. But the second thing is, yes, if I have my registration and somebody, which has 30,000 sound recordings, right, and then somebody else comes in with their one sound recording claiming that composition, mine goes into suspense, and that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Can you make it make sense here in 30 seconds? <laughs> I will try. Um, we... Uh, we are in the process of developing a disputes and overclaims um, module in the portal that will allow members to interact directly um, in a more systematized way around disputes. Um, that is something that we began developing um, more than a year ago, but um, based on the feedback we got from members, we placed a priority on continuing to enhance the matching tool in particular because that was a tool that members saw as most directly allowing them to um, improve data for the benefit of higher payments. But we are going to um, build or complete build and launch uh, this portal um, hopefully before the, uh, the end of this year. Um, in terms of uh, the mechanism, uh, if a work has been registered with us um, for um, more than, I believe, 90 days and a, and a new registration comes in that is inconsistent with that, we don't automatically override that, and we do give a preference to the registration that's been in place. Um, but uh, Ms. North is correct. We do seek the views of both rights holders in that situation because we don't automatically know which of those views is correct. And, um, and in the case of a song like Unchained Melody that is incredibly popular and is covered tens of thousands of times, um, that process can be quite challenging. So I, I do appreciate that Ms. North has some very unique challenges in managing uh, a legacy work uh, like that. Okay, and I'll wait for the second round for myself, and I'll now go back to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Mr. Aaron, um, I don't think we touched on this. When foreign-owned record labels collect royalties on music when it's played abroad, do uh, artists see their share of the money on that right now? Is that, how's that working? Um, if you're talking uh, the sound recording side of the business, um, you said record labels? Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Um, that's not a part of the business that the MLC is involved in, and um, I know there are other organizations that, that work uh, on the sound recording side, like Sound Exchange. Um, they, uh, they do go and um, collect sound recording payments for rights holders around the world. They would probably be in a better position to speak to how that uh, works and where there are opportunities to improve it. Okay, very good. Does anybody else have a comment on that? Yeah, Mr. North. 
I mean, that, that is completely outside of the realm of the MLC, but I do want to raise um, AMFA, the American Music Fairness Act, and the opportunity. Um, currently, we do not, our performers, sound recording owners, do not receive a terrestrial performing, or a performing right for terrestrial radio and other broadcasts of a sound recording. Uh, we are one of a few territories, like I think Saudi Arabia, um, that don't have this right. I think so, it's just Cuba and Iran. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, because you provided this opportunity, I do have to plug AMFA and and uh, sound sound recording owners and performers need to have that right. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Levin. Can you talk about how public performance rights fit into what MMA did? and did not do, and what remains to be done to keep music simply um, affordable for consumers? Thank you for the question. So the, the MMA uh, did, did very little in the, the public performance licensing space. There were some adjustments to how the um, uh, dispute process can play out at the um, in the rate courts that uh, govern the, the BMI and ASCAP consent decrees. There was also a provision about uh, should the Department of Justice ever seek to get, do away with those consent decrees, some notice to Congress. Um, but in general, there was very little kind of at the, the heart of that licensing system. And it is one where, you know, from the service perspective, it is one of uh, the many rights that we need to, uh, uh, the DEMAS members need to license to uh, to operate. Uh, and the U.S. is unique in, the, in its number of performing rights organizations. I think we're up to about six now. Um, and that's not actually the, generally the way it works around the world. Um, it's also, uh, you know, to kind of actually piggyback on, on Ms. North's comment, that while there are entities that don't pay for the public performance of sound recordings, essentially anywhere in the United States that publicly performs music from bars and restaurants to DEMA's members need licenses from the PROs. So it's certainly a marketplace and a licensing space where um, uh, it's important to make sure that it's functioning properly. And I, I know, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald and Congressman Issa, along with uh, Representative Ross, who sent a letter last year to the, uh, the Copyright Office about uh, the potential improvements on transparency in this space. I think that remains right. an area, again, we've talked a lot about data. It comes up all the time in the music industry. Every licensee wants to know what they're licensing. Every rights holder deserves to get their money efficiently and effectively. And so finding improvements uh, to, to make licensing more efficient through improved data, I think, is a real um, uh, area for, for shared uh, uh, undertaking by the licensees, the PROs, and, um, and others. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. My last question had to do with successes and challenges. And thank you all for your answers to all of our questions today. I'd like to ask you, as far as our challenges that you noted, uh, what do you see Congress's role being in um, meeting those challenges? Ms. North. I think the first one is oversight. So we brought up a couple of things. One is there have been unilateral business rules applied um, regarding issues that are already defined by statute. Section 115 is clear about the derivative works exception. That shouldn't have ever been an issue. Uh, we know how public domain works uh, are controlled or not. That should never be an issue. So I think that Congress and the Copyright Office need to pay attention to how the MLC is functioning and most importantly, um, create guardrails so that the MLC remains a neutral pass-through entity. That's what it's supposed to be. It is not supposed to be a judge or arbiter. Thank you, Mr. Molinar. <clears throat> yes, I think in terms of improvements, it's my comments are less about the MLC, but more about the MLC cannot pay out and the, and the streaming services cannot pay the royalties if we don't know what the rates are and if we don't come to some market definition um, quicker and earlier. So my, my improvements would be focused on CRB reform um, and looking where we can support the uh, CRB uh, system, um, whether that is uh, more funds or um, more resources for them so that we can have these decisions for our rates timelier um, and smoother and quicker um, for the entire process. Thank you, Mr. Levin. 
just to follow up on, on Mr. Molinar's comment, the great news is that because of the settlement reached last year, that the rates are set for 2023 and going forward, which allows for, a, a, I think, a more robust conversation about whether and where improvements might be needed in the, the CRB process. In terms of the, the challenges that we see with the MLC, I think I, I think that, that oversight and ongoing engagement from Congress around the MMA and the MLC's operations, as well as from the Copyright Office, are vital. This hearing is an in incredible opportunity to talk about it, to check in, to hear about the incredible progress, and to also identify where, where challenges exist. And so I, I hope this is um, not the last time that this committee continues to engage with um, this, whether it's in a hearing or otherwise. I think the MLC exists solely as a creature of the Music Modernization Act and solely to uh, effectuate the license that was created in that. And so ongoing engagement is vital. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. Um, I agree with Mr. Uh, thank you. I agree with Mr. Levin. I think the ongoing engagement is imperative. Um, we have sought that out uh, whenever we can. Um, as um, a number of you know, we were up uh, on the Hill earlier this spring providing updates to staffers. We did a virtual update at the end of the last year. Um, right before COVID, I came up um, at the very beginning of the process. So um, we welcome the engagement with Congress. We seek it out, and we enjoy regularly, regular conversations with the Copyright Office. And as I said in my remarks, we, we speak regularly with a number of groups um, in the industry that represent a, a large number of stakeholders um, so that we are constantly receiving as much feedback as we can. And then we take that back and we, we undertake the immense challenge of trying to reconcile all of that feedback from all of the people that have an interest in what we do and try to come up with um, policies and practices that meet the needs of um, as many of those stakeholders as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Porter and Mr. Uh, Tashi. Well, I, I, I don't have a, a, a comments. I think challenges have already been addressed, but I applaud this, this uh, committee and, and what you're doing because for the future generations who have aspirations to do music, their whole thrust is doing what they feel is a contribution coming from their heart that hopefully will have an impact with people who listen to it. They don't go into analyticals of what the business processes will be and all, all, all those kinds of things, but they have hopes the future generation would be that there will be committees such as this and others who would have sensibilities to wanting to be sure that they're treated fairly with their, with their gifts in, in a world that, that, that recognize their value and, and would adhere to that. Thank you. Um, echoing what uh, a lot of people have said, but um, it's just great to work together, and I hope that you all will take your passion for music. You mentioned uh, Mr. Isa, Mike Love, and your, your, your uh, enjoyment of the music of the Beach Boys. I'm sure everybody has their own version of that, and just you know, I'm good with Tim McGraw, too. Tim McGraw, yeah. yeah. Just uh, I hope you'll, you'll think about your favorite artists and writers and songwriters and then stay engaged with, you know, the community and, and, and listen and hear people out, you know. And, and I think it's a good thing to just kind of stay connected to that. Thank you. Thank you, and kudos to uh, Chairman Issa for bringing the hearing on the road to Nashville. Thank you. Mr. Klein. I echo those comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. North, I want to go back to the statement you made how we, we want the MLC to be a neutral pass-through entity and not an, an arbiter. Um, the MMA mandates that the MLC Board of Directors consist of 10 publisher representatives and four songwriters. Uh, can you comment on whether you think the MLC is able to achieve that neutrality with its current makeup? and uh, the interests of songwriters are balanced against those of publishers when they disagree? Well, I think the interests of songwriters are not balanced, um, just simply by makeup of that board. It should be more equal. It should be an equal number of songwriters to that number of publishers. But more importantly, you know, the major publishers, they have voluntary direct licenses with the services. So they don't even use the MLC in the same way that an independent music publisher does who does not have the opportunity to enter into voluntary licenses. So to me, we need fewer majors and more indies. And included in the indies are self-administered songwriters. I think we don't have enough. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. Do you want to comment on how the MLC balances the interests of stakeholders and uh, given the imbalance in its membership? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think as Ms. North just noted, um, 
independent publishers represent a unique uh, set of stakeholders who often have interests that are very different from the largest publishers. Um, and so our board is in reality divided among those three stakeholder groups. We um, have representatives of songwriters, independent publishers, and the larger publishers. Um, in that respect, I think we hear um, from all three of those stakeholder groups, and I do think the views um, that we, we receive from those reps um, reflect and represent effectively the, um, the interests of those three groups. Um, I also would just uh, note that um, the, the amount of royalties flowing through direct licenses now is only a few million dollars each month. It's dropped dramatically since the first distribution we did. So very um, little of the royalties that we administer flow through direct licenses. The overwhelming um, uh, amount uh, of royalties flow directly through the MLC. Several of the largest DSPs ended the practice of uh, entering into voluntary licenses when the MLC began operation. So again, voluntary licenses are a very small part of what we do today. All right, let's talk about uh, termination rights. Can you explain the MLC stance on termination rights and the payment of royalties to a publisher after its rights are terminated by the songwriter? Um, as of today, <clears throat> um, we are holding royalties pending the outcome of the Copyright Office's rulemaking process, so uh, that's where we stand at this moment. And what has the MLC done now that the Copyright Office issued its proposed rule contradicting the MLC's view? And what are MLC's plans with respect to getting involved with the Copyright Office's process for issuing a final rule? Um, the Copyright Office didn't contradict our rules so much as it, it, it weighed in and, um, and offered a proposed rule that would um, clarify what previously the law had not clarified, which was the answer to the ultimate question. Um, and in doing so, um, we recognized that, um, that the best thing for us to do right now is to hold monies pending that outcome. We participate in the process. Um, our only view in participating in the process now is to ensure that the office has the operational perspective that we can provide um, so that whatever rule they ultimately issue, we can effectively implement it. And the Copyright Office has issued a notice of inquiry regarding when late fees are triggered for payments by DSPs. What, what is the MLC's position with respect to whether late fees should be paid when a DSP's estimated royalty payments turn out to be short, and how did the MLC go about deciding that? <clears throat> um, our view is uh, that late fees should be paid, and we base that in part on the fact that there are digital services that have already been paying late fees on that basis. So again, this is an area where we've provided a perspective of what the current practices are and our belief for how those practices should be normalized so that all DSPs are adhering to a consistent standard. Okay. I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Tashian and Mr. Porter, one of the changes contained in the MMA was to require the Copyright Royalty Board to use a willing buyer, willing selling, uh, seller standard in determining royalty rights for, rates for songwriters. Can you explain what it means to you to be recognized for the value of your mu music and why it's important to artists that they are paid on a free market basis? Um, you know, this landscape's changing all the time. Um, it's very hard to, um, I listened in on the call a little bit yesterday, Mr. Iso, you were talking about how hard it is to determine um, the value uh, and for stakeholders to, to make those um, decisions. So um, I think it's something that, that we just have to stay on top of, but um, was the question about how, how do you do that or... What was the question about how do you do that? No, the question was... Um, 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 sort of the balance of money, uh, willing buyer, willing seller. Is it making a difference to you? And yeah. Um, well, I, I have not sold my catalog um, as of yet. It's something that I hope to do. Um, but I know a lot of people who have. And uh, so at that point, I'll let you know. Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I, I feel that, well, to be honest, I have sold my cattle. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, f I think for the future generations, I'm, I'm 80 years old. So for me, I'm more concerned about what happens uh, to the next set of, of, of creatives who have a passion to be in this business called music and to do it from their heart and, and to be sure that, that what, they're giving, what they're going to be given in the future will be comparable to what the, the lifestyle should be for those times and, and I, I just feel like like uh, it's an ongoing process 
for, for me, I, I always feel uh, that, that uh, the writers and, and, and artists have never gotten the kind of fair royalties that they should have gotten from the beginning, and it's always a, a positive change that's happening in what this committee is doing and what you, you, you're doing is, is so vitally needed. For, for people to be motivated to want to continue to do this, I, I applaud you for doing that, and I think it's, it's an ongoing process for the next generations to, to see examples of this, such as sensitivities to what they're doing, being compensated in a fair and equitable way. Thank you, Mr. Porter. The Classics Act, which provided protection under the federal copyright laws to music recorded uh, prior to 1972, is an important component of the MMA, obviously. Can you talk about the impact this provision has had on legacy artists and has it made a difference in your ability to be fairly compensated for your work? Without a doubt. I, I know of Sam Moore, who is an artist that I've worked with, uh, he and, and Dave, and I know his feelings about, and I know he's, he, Sherman Ice knows, he, he has made this point known. Uh, I, I hear from his wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand. Uh, but but it's, it's just so, so important that, that artists who, Years ago, I remember years ago, uh, artists were happy to be the stars singing up on the stage, and they didn't realize that the songwriter was getting a, a royalties, and royalties would happen when someone else would record the song in an ongoing way. That was a plus for the writer who, whose name was in small print on the record. They wanted to continue to do that. But as you, if you're going to do this, you want to be sure that everybody is, is fairly treated fairly. And prior to 72, that was not the case, and, and, and the fact that that so many artists have suffered because of that, and this is a means of correcting and making some amends to make a positive change for that in, in what you've done. Uh, it, it's just, it, it has to be a better feeling, and certainly want, people want to, in an ongoing, five years, but people want to, in an ongoing way to see what it's going to do uh, for those people that are still around to appreciate, and certainly for their estates that, and that uh, they'll be able to evaluate it. But uh, it, 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 is, it has been such a suffering of talents for many, many years prior to this happening that uh, I, I applaud you for taking a step. Thank Correct. you, Mr. Aaron. The MLC is responsible for distributing statutory royalties uh, at rates that are set by the Copyright uh, Royalty Board. Can you discuss the importance of those rate determinations being made on a timely basis? Thank you for the question, Mr. Nadler. Uh, it's imperative. You know, quite simply, we can't pay out royalties correctly, if at all, if we don't have the rates. It is a <laughs> fundamental component to the process. So um, the, uh, the lack of finality um, around the rates for the five years leading up to the launch of the MLC and the blanket license has been incredibly challenging. Um, we will spend um, hundreds of thousands of dollars and countless hours of time um, putting together processes that um, we will need in order to reconcile the rates when they're finalized with the work that we've already done. And um, I hope that we don't have to do that again. So it's imperative. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Klein, you had a, a follow-up of one of your questions. Well, I just wanted to give Mr. Levin the opportunity to respond to Mr. Aaron's comments. Yeah, go closer. Sorry. Mr. Mr. Levin, do you want to respond to the question I asked Mr. Aaron about the... About late fees? Yeah. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, I, I think at, at heart, this is a great example of what exactly I've been talking about, about the um, MLC seeking guidance from the Copyright Office rather than imposing a view. While I think Mr. Aaron raised the point that some services have paid late fees, that actually doesn't answer the question of whether the statute and the regulations require them. And the publishers and songwriter advocates are fully within their rights and prerogatives to raise those concerns to the Copyright Office and argue for a position. I know some members of this committee, including yourself, have weighed in with the Copyright Office on the substance of the issue. Um, but what we actually saw in that scenario was MLC submitting comments that were essentially identical to the comments submitted by the publishers, which doesn't actually add, I think, value to the conversation necessarily. To the extent there are operational questions about how to actually facilitate late fee payments, make, through, make sure those payments go through. That seems squarely within the MLC's wheelhouse. But on the actual substance of what the statute requires, that's something that the office actually does have the authority to weigh in on and engage with the stakeholders on and for the MLC to, to subsequently operationalize. Thank you. Okay, now a couple, couple closing questions from me. Uh, Ms. North, you, uh, you opened up by talking about the fact that the PROs are outside the original legislation. In your opinion, and we'll go through others, 
do you believe that that is action that Congress should take to bring them underneath uh, this act? And uh, now that it's up and running uh, for benefit, either compulsory or an opt in. That is such a difficult question. Um, <laughs> Save the best for so, last. So here's, here's what I think. Um, Mr. Fitzgerald had asked about whether including information about the PRO would be helpful or, or which should be data that the MLC includes. Personally, I think yes, because knowing the PRO of the songwriter and or publisher helps us disambiguate data. Um, it might tell me that one song called, I don't know, Just the Way You Are is this song and not this set of parties. However, um, the PROs function pretty well, and I don't think they need additional regulation, and I'd like, I'd like to keep them out of it. Okay. Um, Mr. And one of the administrative items, you're holding currently how much in holdback money for unmatched? Rough number? I can be specific. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, $321 million in pending blanket royalties, Four hundred three million in uh, in historical unmatched royalties. Okay. Do you currently believe that you have the authority to make a partial distribution, holding back sufficient funds to assure that anticipated future matches would still be paid fully? With, uh, in other words, rather than being forsaken, which uh, Ms. North brought up, that it, the moment you issue that money, it's no longer available to a future matchup, and Mr. Porter and others that m may come up with them. Do you believe you can currently split the baby, if you will, do a, dis, uh, uh, a disbursement, which is to the benefit of rights holders who have come forward, and hold back a sufficient amount for, for anticipated future, or is that outside your purview? Um, I, think, I think it's an interesting question. I think as a practical matter, um, were we to do that, it would delay significantly our ability to process and pay the, the, the back half of that because we would have to build a separate, similarly complex reconciliation process in order to then calculate the difference between what we'd initially paid out and what we would finally owe for the historical monies. And that would work differently in many respects from the blanket reconciliation we'll have to do for uh, 2021 and 22. So in, in looking at that... Um, so it's fair to say that the Act did not give you specific guidance, that, which would be the reason you, you wouldn't be able to split it and do a future one as though you were starting again. I think it's fair to say that the MMA did not contemplate this possibility because, of course, at that time it was passed, um, the, the appeal. We thought you'd be perfect and match every single well, song. We're, <laughs> we're, that's just the way it is in Congress. Uh, well, the, the CRB process that we've alluded to before was five years earlier, and so I don't think we knew, uh, any of us knew that we would be where we are today back then. Um, so, and of course, um, for us, um, we have been doing um, a significant amount of work on all of the historical royalties um, since we received that data. So at this point sitting here today, um, what I believe is the best course is for us to um, allow the office and the CRB to finalize the rates, something that we believe is imminent um, for the services to then deliver the rise, revised data, and then we can begin paying out all of the matched royalties um, accurately, um, uh, hopefully um, first thing in 2024. And... Uh uh, the CRB has rulemaking authority. Do you believe that you have uh, superior, concurrent, or simply separate rulemaking authority under the Act? The MLC? Yes. We are not a rulemaking body. But you've been making rules, and that's been the, Ms. North's complaint, is that you haven't sought the CRB, which does have rulemaking authority, to make those decisions. No question at all. What you've been making, it looks a lot like rules. Um, with respect, I think we have... We have put in place policies that describe our operations, and we have sought from the Copyright Office guidance um, where we think the Copyright Office would be in the best position to weigh in. I think it's the Copyright Office's role to ultimately issue regulations that, um, that answer um, questions of policy, and they have done so um, to their great credit uh, in, a, in a myriad of ways um, in a, in also a relatively short period of time. So we consult regularly with the Copyright Office. I think they're the primary place where we would look for that guidance where we need it, and we do. Uh, do you believe you have authority under the Act to, you do believe you have authority under the Act to, have, to issue at late fees? Do you believe that you have the authority to issue, or should you have the authority to issue late fees that would be sufficient to be used in excess in excess of the fair reimbursement to the person who didn't receive the royalty in a timely fashion to also 
allow for general operations or other uses by your organization? No, the, the late fees that we collect are, are passed on to members entirely. We don't use those for operating costs, and they are set by the, the, the regulations or the statute. We, the, we don't second half of the, the second half of the question was, do you think you should? In other words, the business of late fees is not just statutory interest. Mm -hmm. It's intended to uh, be uh, at least partially, in a, in a fair way, partially punitive sufficient mm -hmm. that it causes people to be dissuaded from using you as a bank. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have that authority uh, to collect essentially an amount in excess, is that something that you would like the authority? You know, one of the reasons we're out here is to look for ways that we can enhance compliance, enhance the percentage of matchups. And of course, when you're talking about revenue sufficient to be able to do your job better, we're also looking at it not coming out of necessarily the hide of the good behavior individuals, but perhaps. Uh, revenue that would allow you to innovate in the long run, service your beneficiaries better? I, I certainly think that that's a question um, that, that merits more conversation. We do see um, evidence that there are um, at least a few DSPs who consistently deliver their usage and royalty payments late, um, and, um, and they appear to be pushing uh, the bounds um, that the I just want to. I want to see a little anger. I want a little. I want to see. I want to see you go. No, you're right. I really, I really want to stop the bad actors, and I've heard about them because the good actors they're paying, and quite frankly, it adds to your overhead, doesn't it? And it adds to the frustration of the of the people who want to run their businesses and can't because the revenue isn't coming in. Uh, absolutely, one hundred percent. So if if Congress or the Copyright Office um, would would like to give us more tools. Um, to ensure compliance, we would uh, gratefully accept them and use them with the passion and vigor that you just expressed. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to, uh, we have one minute less left, and I'm going to take a privilege. Mr. Porter, you're the senior member here. I'm kind of one of the senior members here. Tell me, if you could, if you could, if you could ask us to go away with one more thing that we should go work on, what would it be? It would be to continue with the spirit that you're expressing right now. Uh, that is the spirit of wanting to do more and wanting to do it right and wanting to do it because it's the right thing to do. That would be all I could say, sir. Well, with that, we stand adjourned. Well said. Yeah.